know who to make the work on for. Okay, thank you for coming. Thank you, Wendy. Um, it's my pleasure to discuss um, our paper for today, Sand and Tax. Um, Mark is looking at Edgar Keyes' new project. It's built on the idea that states tax in order to spend. Therefore, the authors argue we should analyze taxation and spending together and join them under the idea of appropriate government obligations. There are three main categories of determinants of the appropriate fiscal role of government in a particular time and place. The first is structural context, including economic and geopolitical conditions. Variables in this category, like feudalism or war, have been extensively analyzed uh, by scholars already, and you're probably familiar with them. Analysis. The second category of variables is fiscal culture, defined by the authors as, and I'm quoting, existing beliefs as shaped by information, networks, values, and habits about government taxation and expenditure. The third category of determinants comprises features of political institutions. Together, these forces shape taxation and spending patterns. Part of a larger intellectual project attempting to understand variation in types as well as levels of taxation and spending this paper we read today is primarily focused on explaining the level of public goods provision in states. To that end, it explores how fiscal culture can shape policy choices. While the range of, the range of feasible policies is set by structural economic, structural economic conditions and political institutions, fiscal culture determines government obligations through two channels. First, through the ideology and mental schemes of leaders and policymakers. And second, by shaping the boundaries of what the authors call the community of faith, the set of people who are included in the us. Now, there are two aspects of this project that I find particularly exciting. The first is that it brings taxation and spending together and proposes to look at their, at their respective compositions as well as their levels. Um, asking how these two relate to each other sets a novel research agenda, I believe. And there's a lot we can learn from the question, where does the money come from and where does it go? The second aspect of this project that I find very promising is the incorporation of ideas in our theories of taxation and spending, what the authors call fiscal culture. By including such cultural and ideational factors in the theory, we can overcome the duality I believe exists between the way we write economic history, where we will always refer to the existing economic orthodoxy or the effect of past economic experiences on policymakers' choices, and the way we do fiscal theory, where we typically assign ex ante equal, equal probabilities of adoption to any technically feasible policy option um, that's in the support of the function we're maximizing. So I'll make three broad points about the theory. The first is that while I welcome this inclusion of fiscal culture, um, I think the concept is not yet very precise as it is. Um, so first, you acknowledge that fiscal culture can be shaped from bottom up as well as from the top down. But which aspect matters more for particular questions you might want to answer? For example, the paper emphasizes a citizen's fiscal culture for quasi-voluntary compliance, yet your definition of fiscal culture seems to give a greater weight to policymakers than to states. Do these reflect each other, or when do they do so? Do they have the same role to play in the theory? I believe that it may be helpful to discuss the different ways in which different agents like citizens and, and policymakers, fiscal culture shape taxation and spending. My second thought is about the adoption of the classic duality between the ruler's preferences and the state's capacity to realize those preferences. So while I agree, I agree that we definitely need a conceptual distinction between the two, I find that theorizing them independently has not been very fruitful in the past, mainly because of the observational equivalence of lack of capacity and lack of will. So I believe that you make great progress on this issue of administrative capacity with this paper by theorizing the three-way interaction between ruler, bureaucracy, and citizens. I'm referring to the integration between the principal agent and quasi-voluntary compliance models. So this latter model allows you, as it were, to endogenize administrative capacity to the past interaction and exchange between the state and the citizenry. I would say that the next step is to endogenize administrative capacity to the ruler's preferences, at least partly. What I mean is that we could model, starting from the ruler's preferences, whether leaders, whether leaders choose to use all of the existing capacity, and whether or not they choose to invest or disinvest in this capacity. So finally, um, I'd like to open up a broader debate about what the objects of study are in this project. What, what's your interest in here? And do we want to explain the variation in taxing and spending schemes, or do we want to 
um, explain long-term continuity, do we want to explain breaking points and predict paths? And also, what's particular, of particular interest to me, are there certain methods that are more strict for studying these questions? Now, it looks like we might have to go beyond theorizing one-way linear sex, uh, given the state, the, the, the richness of your theory. Uh, we have to take into account recursive processes, feedbacks, non-linear effects, um, and hopefully we can make our models to keep up with the, with the wealth of ideas and <coughs> our data to them. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. We made the paper much better than I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so, <laughs> really, and this was very helpful. So let, let me give you just a little bit of background on this paper to sort of um, tell you where I'm coming from. And I also have to say that I remember giving a talk in this very room, I'm pretty sure, years and years and years ago. Thank you. You probably were there. You would have been the only person here who would have been. Possibly been there, which was on the book that became In the Interest of Others. And I was talking about the labor unions and the Walsh workers. And it was equally, people sort of looked at me, why are you? doing that? <laughs> no, you're imagining that. <laughs> well, I think appropriately imagining that, because the questions made me think, why am I doing that? <laughs> and it ended up being what I think is, I was telling Francis earlier, a, a book co-authored with John Alquist, and I think the best thing I've ever done. So I was really looking forward to coming here at this very early moment in a project where I'm sort of wondering, why am I doing this? Um, for multiple reasons, I'm wondering, uh, and getting feedback from all of you that will hopefully get Edgar and I moving a little better in the right direction. So this project has a, both a long history and a very, very, very short history, which explains why the paper is not more coherent, though less part of that. The long history is my long-standing interest in issues of tax collection as a way to and revenue production and quasi-voluntary compliance as a way to understand government and state building more generally and the interaction with citizens and governments, which is my really deep concern and interest in almost everything that I do. And I moved away from that because the what drove me to think about taxes were these larger questions of which taxes was a way to think about it, revenue production. Um, and was driven back to it um, partially because I love working with Edgar Kaiser, who's a sociologist at the University of Washington, who came as an assistant professor when I was already, I think, associate or full, um, and whose dissertation was had drawn on my work. And, but he went on to criticize what I'd done and to create a whole other opening in the literature, uh, particularly thinking about principal agent models and when they worked and when they didn't. And, thinking about the capacity to collect taxes in a variety of domains and locations that I knew very little about. We were both invited to be the discussants at a conference, as it turns out, at Stanford a couple of years ago of historians going from ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Greece to the most contemporary stage with the Incas, which is 18th century, um, 19th century, I guess, 18th century, when the, or 17th when the Incas sort of um, dissipate as a society. And we were the discussants and we wrote a paper together and we thought, you know, it'd be fun to do something together. And so out of that came this idea to work on a book together. The first instinct was to really do something on taxes. The second instinct was to do something on spending, which is really where I came in. I was telling Milis we're still sort of disagreeing about this. So at the moment, it's got, there is a chapter on taxes that's in worse state than this, um, and this one on the beginning of thinking about spending. Because the issue that really keeps me up at night, the intellectual, political issue that keeps me up at night, is really why do governments shift around the way they do over time, across place, across history, um, about what they think it is that they should be providing to their citizens. Why does that vary? And we have some hints about that. Um, and we know that it can, we know that there's a certain kind of stability in the way a government thinks about public goods, or that's the term we want to use, or the government goods and services. But we also know that it can shift very quickly. Um, it shifts in the United States, just to give an example, it shifted during the New Deal, it shifted again during the Reagan period, and you can 
look at that kind of shit in many other parts of the world. Um, and certainly, if you're looking at the long historical array, you see a lot of, of difference. So what, what accounts for that? And um, it can't simply be, I don't think it's, my instinct is that it's not simply um, economic uh, exogenous shocks or endogenous shocks, because the economy is endogenized to a certain large extent. But it can't just be an economic shock. It's not simply that new ideas come to the forefront in economics, because even again using the case of the US, the same ideas are going back and forth and back and forth, and they get, they get handed on to the same economic and political theorists, Keynes and Hayek, um, you know, and just who's winning that particular ideological battle at that moment. So we began to play with this notion of fiscal culture, which comes in part out of the work that I did with John Aswist um, in thinking about communities of faith as a crucial part of the story of why it is that you see variation in um, organizations. Um, and the communities of faith, in that case, was linked to, to unions, which we saw as mini governments. They tax by collecting dues, they make demands of their citizens, they have to provide services, um, namely economic well-being. And yet they vary immensely in what else they think citizens should be doing and whether or not they should be acting in ways that actually are costly and have nothing to do with uh, the reason the union exists, which are to improve the wages, hours, and benefits of the workers. So that led us to think about there's something going on that is defining and redefining who is part of the polity, who gets the goodies of the society, who should, who has responsibility for others and who doesn't, and why that changes over time as part of the key to understanding why it is not the only thing, but a factor, an important factor in understanding what's going on over time. So you were asking me what's driving me, and again, it's coming back to this you know, who's the citizenry, what's their relationship to government, what do they have the right to expect and to demand of government and how, and in a variety of settings. So that being said, this is a, as you who have read it, or have heard, I, Mila saved it by making it more, far more coherent than it is, um, it's almost a string of thoughts about some of these issues. It's a very free and fair we haven't figured out our cases yet. We haven't exactly figured out our method, except we'll, as we both do, use a lot of history and a lot of historical cases. <coughs> It'll probably be case-based in some way, but then there'll be lots of kinds of evidence that come to bear in those cases. But the way in which we both work is we sort of develop our basic theoretical argument first, which should then generate some testable implications. Um, and then to explore them in a variety of settings, which might then change our theories. So the book may look very different than this. And what will look very different than this. <coughs> but the arguments may be quite different than this in the end. So that's just what I wanted to add to it, both an apology um, and a plea for help. <laughs> well, I think um, we will open it up for questions and comments. I should have been thinking more than this would be late. Okay. Dalton, you go ahead and then those of you who have want to add to Kate first. Is this the I know he's already Wait, sorry, sorry. You must say your name. Oh, right, right. You um, must say your name. <laughs> and say hi Ed. Hi Ed I'm Gotham. I'm a, a student in a political science department. Um my actually I just want to follow up on Melissa's question. Chapter is focusing on political culture, uh, also or rather fiscal culture. Is the focus on elites or is it on kind of masses? Now maybe there is there is no distinction, but presumably because you think of rulers as being quite different from, or this electorate as being different from the, the rest of the population. So if you just say a little bit more about where you want the fiscal culture to really work. That's a question. Um, sometimes we go around and take a bunch of questions to consolidate them. Does anybody have a, a follow-up exactly on this point? Otherwise, we will let Margaret uh, run. Maybe you can just 
Oh, yeah, uh, Rob Blair. Uh, just as a 